It's of the most stupendous magnitude. Measures which will affect the lives of millions, born and unborn, are now before us. We must expect a great expense of blood to obtain them. But we must always remember that a free constitution of civil government cannot be purchased at too dear a rate, as there is nothing on this side of Jerusalem of greater importance to mankind. This is something altogether unexpected. Not only a declaration of our independence, but of the rights of all men. Now, this is this is this is well said, sir. Very, very well said. When in the course of human events it becomes necessary for one people to dissolve the political bands which have connected them with another. A decent respect requires that they declare the causes which impel them to the separation. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights. What are we to do with that embarrassing, annoying document, the Declaration of Independence? What of its conceits? All men created equal, inalienable rights, life, liberty, and so on and so forth. Of all the words written here about freedom, there's a line that's at the heart of all the others. But when a long train of abuses and usurpations, pursuing invariably the same object, evinces a design to reduce them under absolute despotism, it is their right, it is their duty, to throw off such government and provide new guards for their future security. We, therefore, the representatives of the United States of America, do and with the authority of the good people of these colonies, solemnly publish and declare that these United Colonies are, and of right ought to be, free and independent states, that they are absolved of all allegiance to the British Crown, and that all political connection between them and the state of Great Britain is and ought to be totally dissolved. In the support of this declaration, with a firm reliance on the protection of divine providence, we mutually pledge to each other our lives, our fortunes, and our sacred honor. People don't talk that way anymore. Beautiful. Huh. No idea what you said. It means if there's something wrong, those who have the ability to take action have the responsibility to take action. I don't know about you, but as I watched some of those clips and as I put together just that montage of different movies that I've seen throughout the years, there were moments in each and every one of those movies that declared and established the conviction in the heart of man. You know, I, w I was thinking about it, and I shared this with the, the staff just a little bit before we prayed for our services this morning. As you watch that video, there's something that's crazy, and, and, and we, it, it doesn't even cross our mind today, but there were 56 men in the Declaration of Independence that were willing to sign their name on the dotted line, so to speak starting with the largest of all of them, and that was John Hancock. And we, we're very familiar with what his signature is the most recognizable on the Declaration of Independence. But as you were hearing moments and statements throughout history, and as people were contemplating this document, they were contemplating this freedom. Do you realize that 56 individuals literally were signing their death warrant? There was a conviction that was so strong within their heart. There was a conviction so strong within them that they were willing to sign 
what very may well have been the last and most important thing they'd ever written. The conviction of our forefathers caused them to consider the cost, caused them to weigh the outcomes, and caused them to strive for freedom. Guys, I, my, my goal this morning, my de desire this morning, my, my endeavor this morning is to reestablish within you this power of conviction. We live in a nation right now that is in turmoil. We live in a nation that is on its ear. We're, we're in a nation where bad is good and good is bad. Up is down and down is up. But these individuals understood the power of conviction. Heavenly Father, as we come to you this morning, we pray for our nation. We take a pause in the middle of our message and, and we, we, we just, before we even get started, God, we, we invoke Holy Spirit right now into this place. And for those under the sound of my voice, Father, I'm asking us, Heavenly Father, that there would be something within us that, there wouldn't be, that we would move from this position of complacency and move into this position of conviction. Because, Father, we know what this nation was built upon. We know the, the truths that, that set forth our freedom. And as Pastor Barry was talking about, without the freedom set forth through Christ, the nation itself cannot be free. And so, Father, we just ask right now under the sound of my voice, let my tongue be that of a ready writer. Let me declare and speak, Heavenly Father, of your goodness and your glory. But, Lord, let us not forget how and why we started as a nation. Father, we give you praise in Jesus' name. Amen. If you'll do me a favor and turn with me to the book of he, uh, Nehemiah. I, 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 as I've been contemplating this message, Nehemiah chapter 1 is where we're going to start. That's going to be the foundation of our message today. But guys, conviction is a powerful motivation. Conviction is a powerful motivation. Those of us that want to keep our jobs, the conviction we have when that little buzzer goes off. Neat, 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 neat. Guess what? Conviction says, i got to get up and go to work today. There's a motivation. There's a motivation. Conviction, it's amazing in our lives how much we have convictions in certain areas and in, in, the, in other areas, Pastor Candy, we've let conviction go. Hebrews tells us that we've got to be careful that there are things that we can let slip. And if we let those things slip, where does that conviction hold us together today? Nehemiah chapter 1, we're going to find the story of conviction. I'm going to be reading out of the uh, New Living Translation. I'm sorry, my, my translation might be a little different than the translation that's up there again, but follow me along as we go. These are the memoirs of Nehemiah, son of a... Hel okay, I, I, I practiced this, but I'm going to get it wrong. Hekalia. That's how you say it. I, I, listened to the, I listened to the Hebrew, and I was trying this morning. Hakalia, Hakalia. Pastor Candy and Pastor Barry walked in the office. What are you doing? Nothing? I was really honestly, Pastor Barry, just trying to say that word. Because I knew if I could get that word, it would be good. But in the memoirs of Nehemiah, the son of Hakalia, in late autumn of the 20th year, King Xerxes' reign, I was in the fortress of Susa. Hanani, one of my brothers, came to visit me. And, and, and with some other men who had just arrived from Judah, I asked them about the Jews who, were, who had survived the captivity and about to how things were going in Jerusalem. They said unto me, things are not going well. Sounds kind of familiar today, doesn't it? Things aren't going so well. He says, things, things are not going well for those who return to the province of Judah. They are in great trouble and disgrace. The wall of Jerusalem has been torn down and the gates have been burned. When I heard this, I sat down... And wept. In fact, for days I mourned, fasted, and prayed to the God of heaven. Then I said, O Lord, God of heaven, the great and awesome God, who keeps his covenant of unfailing love with those who love him and obey his commands, listen to my prayer. Look down and see me praying night and day for, the, for your people, Israel. I confess that we have sinned against you. Yes, even my own family and I have sinned. We have sinned terribly by not observing the commands, laws, and regulations that you gave us through your servant Moses. 
Please remember what you told your servant Moses. If you sin, I will scatter you among the nations. But if you return to me and obey my commands, even if you are exiled to the ends of the earth, I will bring you back to the place I have chosen for my name to be honored. We are your servants, the people you rescued by your great power and might. O oh Lord, please hear my prayer. Listen to the prayers of those who delight in honoring you. Please grant me success now as I go and ask the king for a great favor. Put it into his heart to be kind to me. In those days, I was the king's cupbearer. I read this verse and I thought to myself, my goodness, could we not right now lay the nation of America upon this article, upon this Old Testament story of the, of the children of Israel? And here was a man, Nehemiah. There's incredible stories. In fact, I love teaching from the book of Nehemiah on the subject of leadership. Maybe one of these days I'll get to do that. But when I read this passage again over the last couple of weeks, I don't know about you, but I know where I've been. I've been in a position of mourning. As I watch the news, as I watch social media, as I watch the unpacking of the left and the right, as, as I watch what's going on, there's something inside of me that's breaking because we have left this power of conviction. We We've got a false conviction that's taking place. We've got a false narrative that is being communicated and it's becoming the chief narrative of our nation. And guys, we have to remember that there's this conviction upon what this nation was birthed upon and that was Jesus Christ. I'm sorry, I'm a little stirred up, but I'm not going to apologize in all reality because the truth is, guys, we sit here and we, we, we just allow things to take place. I'm not talking about us being these individuals that, that we become ralliers, but I'm talking about where is the house of God walking in the power of the Spirit when we have the opportunity to speak the truth of God's Word? Do we do it? Nehemiah was a book about rebuilding what was broken. Guys, as much as we have the greatest nation on this planet, we are broken. Because what we've done is we've not done. We, we, we have followed in the footsteps of Judah. We have followed in the footsteps of Israel where we've left the God that we once served. And the Bible was very clear and Nehemiah communicated in this passage. He said to them, God, when we chose our way, we're scattered. We're scattered now, church. We're in a place right now where there's absolutely no foundational direction unless we, like Pastor Barry was saying, pay attention to what was going on in that flag. Let me ask you a question. As a believer, is conviction the motivation that moves you? This morning... As we're ministering in this room right now, and under the sound of my voice, I'm not sure which camera we're looking at, but the truth of the matter is, are we people, are we believers that are motivated by the convictions that we have? Or do we just float along in a river, taking us any way the wind of doctrine flows? Because guys, if I'm not rooted and founded within this word, if I'm not rooted and founded in here, you're going to be swayed by whatever is communicated. Guys, I have, I'm so tired of what people are saying about what is truth and what's not truth. This is the only thing that's truth. This has got to be the conviction that I hold dear in my heart. When people start to declare things, where does my foundation lie? These actions are most meaningless without conviction. Let me give you an example of what I'm talking about. Whether I'm fighting a war or whether I'm taking a stand against tyranny. What says I love you? What says I forgive you? What says forgive me? What says thank you? Those are convictions that we hold in our heart. Throughout the Bible, we've learned about men and women who had the conviction that moved them to do something. Whether you're looking at Noah who built an ark, whether you look at Abraham who left his home not knowing where he was going, whether we talk about Isaiah who spoke to a nation about their rebellion, or whether we talk about Ruth who would not leave her mother-in-law. She was actually, her mother-in-law said, no, go back to your people. She said, no, I'm not leaving you. There was something inside of Ruth that said, I'm going to follow you. 
Daniel. Because of who Daniel was and the convictions he held dearly, guess what? He outlasted lions. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, because of their conviction, stood the test of the fiery furnace. And when the king looked into that fiery furnace, he said, I thought we threw three men in there. And all of a sudden they said, but I see four, one looking as if it was the Son of God. Guys, when we walk according to this power of conviction, it's not just you they see, it's the power of God present. Or what about Esther? I want us all to be like Esther right now. The Bible says that Esther was ready and she was established. And you know what I'm about to say for such a time as this. Guys, you're not, you weren't birthed into this generation by accident. There's a reason why you're even in the church house today. There's a reason why the Spirit of God lives and dwells within you. And as we communicate back and forth, I need you to grasp this conviction that's burning and burdened within my heart this morning. As I've been praying over this message, like our nation, our very faith was formed within this position of conviction. The conviction of men and women who accepted Jesus Christ as their Lord and personal Savior and were willing to die. Hebrews chapter 11 goes through this incredible parallel of incredible men and women that they fought the good fight of faith. They, they did what they did, but then there were some that didn't come through on the champion side, but they were still recognized as champion. The Bible said some were sawn asunder. Some were put before the lions. Guys, I, I don't know about you, but, but, but I'm kind of in this, I, 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 I want to be this I want to be this, this encourager, this motivator, this, this high-level guy. Hey, guys, you got this. You got this. I want you leaving here going, we got this. We got this. But at the same time, I've got to be honest with you. I can't hold back and tell you it's, it's hell out there. And, guys, it's only going to get worse. So where are you in this statement and, the, and in this faith of conviction? Are you individuals? That when the enemy comes, are you going to be able to withstand what the enemy brings? Let's ask ourselves a few questions. The very conviction of the men and women who accepted Christ and shared the message with everyone they came in contact with. I've got three questions I want to ask you real quickly is this. Does conviction create your reality? The Bible says this in Hebrews chapter 11, 1. It says, now faith is the assurance, the confirmation, and the title deed of the things we hope for, being the proof of things we do not see, the conviction of their reality. Is the conviction of your reality founded within the faith of the Word of God? Do you formulate, do you fashion everything about your life? How you act, how you respond, how you think, how you speak, how you move. By the very reality that your faith is who you are. Number two, have I allowed conviction to construct my conduct? Have I allowed conviction who I am? I'm not a liar. I speak the truth. Or does that waffle when things get tough? Because I meet Christians, depending on... The environment in which they are, they're incredible chameleons. They shift and they move. And they, but you know what? It was funny. One time I was going to tell my wife when we were pastoring at Union City 18 years ago. There was one time I had started this thing called the purchase order system in our church. And it was funny. A group of individuals came up to Dana and they said they handed Dana the purchase order. And they said, would you ask Pastor Bob? If he would sign off on this. And she looked at them and she said, you know what? You'd be better off getting it than me. But my convictions, my convictions were the same with my wife as they are with my church members. Guys, I'm not, I'm, I don't want to be a situational person. In this situation, I'll be this way. But in this situation, I'll be this way. Conviction says I'm a principled individual. And I live by the principles within the word. If I shift and move according to different things, I've got to be very, very careful. 2 Corinthians 5, 7 says, For we walk by faith. We relegate our lives and conduct ourselves by our convictions. How do you conduct yourselves? Number three, is conviction, is conviction the cornerstone of your salvation? Can I take your salvation from you at any level? 
You know, it's amazing when you look at this verse in Hebrews 13, 7. It says, remember your leaders and superiors in authority, for it is they who brought to you the word of God. Observe attentively and consider their manner of living, the outcome of their well-spent lives, and imitate their faith, their conviction that God exists and is the creator and ruler of all things. When we understand these things, as we prepare to celebrate 4th of July coming up this next Saturday, I was thinking about our nation and how conviction caused men to do several things. Desire to separate from tyrannical rule, define, define that men were created equal, declare their liberty from an unfair taxation, and develop a nation founded upon truths of God and the freedom of religion. It wasn't it wasn't the freedom from religion. It was the freedom of religion. For the time that God began to put it into the hearts of men, they formulated the foundation of our nation, and they were based upon Christian principles. We're getting ready to celebrate Fourth of July, and we'll have a picnic, we'll have a party. We might even go out to the lake. We might have a barbecue. We might shoot off a few fireworks. But guys, let me bring, bring you back to what conviction really meant. If we, if we consider our present state of affairs in America, the revisionists and reformists would change the reality of our history. That's their goal right now. They're trying to reframe and reformat what we were made on. They're trying to, this week, they're, th this week and last week and the week before, they're tearing down. You know, when they, when they stopped tearing down the, 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 the statues of those that were considered evil, they started tearing down statues of those that were for them. And now they've gone to tearing down statues of Christianity. What's coming next? The very steeple on this building? What is the next step? Sadly, students no longer are taught the truth about our nation and about the Christian faith that helped it create. As a result, we find our walls in despair, our gates are in cinders, and the hearts of our people are hardened. When we look at this passage in the book of Nehemiah, we see what was taking place, and we ought to weep like Nehemiah wept over the nation. Our current culture is trying to erase truth from our nation. However, if we investigate the words of our founders, it is evident that God and faith were a quintessential convictional part of who we should and always should be. Faith was found in our nation's beginning. I'm going to read to you from several documents, and my goal is not to bore you, but my goal is to inspire you to reestablish what this nation was built upon. Christopher Columbus, in his book, The Book of Prophecies, says this, I prayed to the Lord about my heart's desire, and he gave me the spirit and intelligence for the task. It was the Lord who put into my mind, I could feel his hand upon me, to sail from here to the Indies. All who heard of the project rejected it with laughter, ridiculing me. There is no question that the inspiration was from the Holy Spirit because he comforted me with rays of marvelous illumination from the Holy Scriptures, encouraging me to continually press forward without ceasing. Christopher Columbus was a man of conviction. It was their belief in God through, through his sovereignty that men were compelled and convicted to discover a new world. And this new world was going to be a place upon which America was birthed. As men wrote of their state charters and made their declarations, the power of conviction. When we look at that word conviction, that word conviction is this. Doing or saying it with purpose, with a belief that it is true. When we look at a conviction, doing or saying it with purpose, these men did it with a purpose. They did it with a belief that what they were saying and doing was absolutely true. Proverbs 14.34 says this, Righteousness exalts a nation, but sin is a reproach of the people. 
Conviction was realized through their beliefs. Let me share this thought with you real quickly as conviction was realized through their beliefs. Noah Webster made this statement, let it be impressed on your mind that God commands you to choose for rulers just men who will rule in the fear of God. In other words, pick guys that love God. George Washington, I've seen several of his statues pulled over already. In his farewell address, made this statement. And let us with caution indulge the supposition that morality can be maintained without religion. Whatever can be con conceded to the influence of refined education on minds of peculiar structure, reason and experience both forbid us to expect that national morality can prevail in the exclusion of religious principles. Outside of church, outside of what's taught by the conviction of the Word of God, we cannot have a moral nation. And we wonder why we are where we are. So we've talked a little bit about conviction was realized through beliefs, but conviction was also affirmed in the foundations of their state charters. These are going to blow your mind, guys. If you've not heard these, I found these, and I think they're incredible, and you might want to go study them out, because I, I stopped at four or five. But look at what this said in Rhode Island. Their charter, their state charter in 1663 said this, the colonies are to pursue with peace and loyal minds their sober, serious, and religious intentions in holy Christian faith. A most flourishing civil state may stand and best be maintained with full liberty in religious governments rightly grounded on what? The gospel of Jesus Christ. Look at what it says in the Delaware Constitution of 1776. It says, every appointed, everyone appointed, say everyone, everyone, to a public office must say, I do profess faith in God the Father and in the Lord Jesus Christ, his only Son, and in the Holy Ghost, one God forevermore. And I do acknowledge the Holy Scriptures of the Old and New Testaments to be given by divine inspiration. That was how you were allowed to serve in the state of Delaware. Go to my next one, please. I'm going to create a bullet here. Are you ready? I'm just giving it to you. Every, this, is, this is the Constitution of Pennsylvania. And each member, before he takes his seat, shall make and describe the following declaration. I do believe in one God, the creator and governor of the universe, the rewarder of good and the punisher of wicked. That is as clear as it gets, guys. Let's bring it home now. You ready? Everybody ready to bring it home to Tennessee? All right, let's show us the next one. It says, no person who denies the being of God or future state of rewards and punishments, that's heaven and hell, shall hold any office, say any office, any office in the civil department of this state. If we were to stop at those four and not continue studying any more of these, that should be enough for us to build and birth within us a conviction that the word of God must be our motivating force to maintain what we're walking through. But it wasn't just the conviction of the men, it was convictions of those that were watching. Listen to this. Historically, the importance of keeping others or, or keeping it's this history before our people is the responsibility of those with the voice of truth. Alex de Tocqueville, a French political thinker and historian best known for his democracy in America, made and said this about our country when visiting in 1831. I sought for the greatness of the United States in her commodious harbors, her ample rivers, her fertile fields, and boundless forests, and it was not there. I sought for it in her rich mines, her vast world commerce, her public school system, and in her institutions of higher learning. It was not there. I looked for it in her democratic congress and her matchless constitution, and it was not there. Not until I went into the churches of America and heard her pulpits flame with the righteousness did I understand the secret of her genius and her power. America is great because America is good. And if America ceases to be good, America will cease to be great. That's a Frenchman trying to investigate who we are as a nation. 
As we get ready to close, I have three very simple bullet points that I want to bring to your attention. Flip over with me, if you will, to Nehemiah chapter 9. Everybody doing okay? Nehemiah chapter 9. Nehemiah chapter 9. And I want to read out of verse 33. Let me see if I can find it here real quickly. Hallelujah. Nehemiah, like our forefathers, had a conviction about his city and about his people. And it propelled him to rebuild the wall. Nehemiah also withstood and understood that the conviction that for a nation to be great, she had to be righteous. Verse 33 says this, Yet you have been righteous in all that has come upon us, for you have dealt faithfully, and we have acted wickedly. Guys, we as a nation, if we as Christians don't become Christians, if we don't allow the conviction of the Holy Spirit to dwell within us richly, what do we have to look forward to except more of what we're currently experiencing? Guys, the thing that I love about America is that we have freedom of speech. I don't mind freedom of speech. But what I do mind is that when freedom of speech now dictates how I must speak. Because that's not freedom of speech any longer. It's okay. We've not done everything right. We've not done everything excellent. We've actually done some things pretty wickedly. But the reality is, guys, until we understand what righteousness is, we can never become what God wants us to be. Psalms 37, 17 says, The Lord upholds the righteous. Psalms 146, verse 8 says, The Lord loves the righteous. Psalms 37, 25 says, I have been young and now I am old, yet I am not seen the righteous forsaken or his descendants begging for bread. Pastor just spoke about that. I believe it was a week ago. Proverbs 10, 3 says, The Lord is will not allow the righteous soul to famish. Proverbs 10, 28 says, the hope of the righteous will be gladness. And Proverbs 12, 28 says, in the way of righteousness, there is life. Guys, we've got to understand what it means to be righteous. Three real quick bullet points and we're going to get ready to close. The road to righteousness is clear. Number one, righteousness is the product of faith. Where's your faith? What's your faith founded in? What's your faith birthed upon? Hebrews eleven seven says, By faith Noah, being divinely warned of things to come, moved with a godly fear. Faith moved him. Romans three twenty two says this, Even the righteous of God, though through faith in Jesus Christ, to all and all who believe, for there is no difference. Righteousness is the foundation, and it's the product of, of faith. Number two, righteousness is the product of wisdom. Righteousness is the product of faith, but number two, righteousness is the product of wisdom. When we look at righteousness, when we look at that original definition of wisdom, and this is another one of those words that I cannot declare, but the character or the quality of righteousness, of being right or just, is formerly spelled right wiseness. which clearly expresses its meaning. 1 Corinthians 1.30 says this, But of him are you in Christ Jesus, who of God is made unto us wisdom and righteousness and sanctification and redemption. Psalms 37.30, the first part of that verse says this, The mouth of the righteous man utters wisdom. I can tell whether or not a person's walking in wisdom or not by how they speak. Because when they speak, the Bible says they speak with the very oracles of heaven. Out of this mouth comes blessing and cursing. But the Bible says that my mouth is going to be one that speaks blessing because it ought not be both ways. A man that walks according to wisdom is a man that walks in righteousness. Number three, righteousness is the product of surrender. Guys, I'm just going to say this and we're going to close your life is not your own. 
we have our pretty houses, we drive our fancy cars, we, we, we've got our good jobs, we've got our vacations planned. But there's a conviction in me the older I get. I apologize to all of my senior saints in the room. I was an ignorant young person. But as I've gotten older, I think all of us in the room would understand that the things of this world become strangely dim as I move closer and closer into his glorious light. Because the more I learn about the word, I want to be the same person loving my wife as loving my church. I want to be the same person as loving that little girl who's running our video camera right now as loving the people of this church. Because if I'm a different person, my convictions aren't real. If my convictions are founded and they're the same all the time, I cannot be labeled a hypocrite. But righteousness is a product of surrender. 2 Corinthians 5.21 says this, For he made him who knew no sin to become sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God. Jesus said this, I... I don't need to do this anymore. I need to take care of this. I'm going to make myself of no reputation. And righteousness is revealed in surrender. What must become a people of conviction? The dictionary clearly defines conviction as, as the state of being convinced. How convinced are you today? What are you convinced about so much that others see it in you? My last quote is this, and we're going to pray. C.S. Lewis said this, Tolerance is a virtue of a man without conviction. We begin to tolerate things. And you know, all of us have opportunities to speak truth. I'm not talking about walking up to somebody and sticking your finger in their face and totally causing them to reject you because a couple of weeks ago I made this statement, people don't care what you have to say. But at the moment of right and wrong and they see that you choose right and it goes against their, their life, now all of a sudden you have a platform upon which you can declare why you have chosen right. With every head bowed and every eye closed, this is not necessarily an altar call moment, but I'm going to make the altar available for you. Because I would say in this room, there are people in here that have allowed their convictions to waffle. And it's okay if you need to find your face on the the, the floor of the church. That's okay because you know what? Ultimately, guys, it's not about you making any kind of statement to me. It's not about you raising your hand to me. It's about you making a declaration to God that says, like Nehemiah said, we have dealt wickedly with you, God, and we're sorry. Because the first thing that we need to do is repent. So if, with that being said, if you're just sitting here in this, and you're not looking, you're, I'm not going to ask you to come up, but what I'm asking is in the room right now, you would raise your hand and you'd say, Pastor Bob, I, I, I realize that my convictions have gotten weak. And there's areas of your life that those convictions need to be, need to be depth. They need to be deeper. They need to be sure. They need to be more true. I want you to just raise your hand and say, Pastor, pray for me. Just pray for me. If you need, you need stronger convictions, you need a conviction in your life at some level. Hand, there's a hand, there's a hand, there's a hand, there's a hand. See, there's multiple hands. But before we talk about conviction, I think everybody in the room may be saved, but I'm going to give an opportunity because there might be somebody watching by my by video. Is there anybody in the room that you're convicted right now because you're not living for Jesus? You've not accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and personal Savior. And I don't want to let a service go by without an opportunity to pray for you. Is there anybody in the room that needs to get right with God right now? Just raise your hand real quickly. Praise the Lord. Everybody stand to your feet. I want to pray over the congregation real quick. Guys, I love you. It's 1015. I went about five minutes past where I wanted to land, but that's okay. Because, guys, I want you to, if, if, I, if my convictions are even just a little bit contagious, I want to ask that they would bleed over into you. Just raise your hands right now as we get ready to go. Father, we just calm ourselves for just a minute. This is a stirring message that within us, Heavenly Father, there are convictions. And in some arenas, we've allowed those convictions to go. 
Father, our nation right now is kind of on its ear, but God, we know and believe, Lord, that if the church would reestablish her convictions upon righteousness, faith, wisdom, and surrender to an almighty God, Father, we know and believe the Bible says that we can be brought back together. And just like Nehemiah, when he looked upon what was going on, the burning of the build, the, the destruction of the walls, the burning of the gates, Father, our nation is jacked up right now. But Father, I'm just asking right now that you'd forgive us. Cause us to walk according to righteousness. Cause us to be men and women of conviction. Father, I pray for the people that raised their hands. They were bold and they were brave. They said to me, their pastor, I, I'm, I'm struggling in some areas of conviction. Father, I just ask, Lord, that you give them supernatural strength and give them a determination to dig out of the word the place in which that help can come. Father, I pray as we go our separate ways this week, as we celebrate Independence Day, Father, we remember the Bible says that he whom the Son sets free is free indeed. And Father, for those of us in this room, we thank you for that freedom. We thank you for the honor to serve the King of kings and the Lord of lords. Now, as we go, Father, we just pray that your protection would be round about us. Allow us, Heavenly Father, to speak your word with declaration. And Father, I pray, God, that you would allow us, Heavenly Father, to prosper and be in health, even as our soul prospers. Father, we thank you for it now. In Jesus' name, amen. Guys, I love you so much. I, 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 I couldn't love you anymore, but I, there's moments that I'll throw my face in this floor and I'll just weep because I want you to get everything that God has. I desire that God continues to pour into you every single day. Because you know what? I think it's going to get pretty hard out there. And we're going to need each other to make it through. Amen? Amen. God bless you. I love you. I'll see you guys on Wednesday night at 6.30. We'll be right back here.